Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar Hayes Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. Along with the analysis today, we have also included clarification for few comments asked by our viewers. The handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description box and they are also provided in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let's move on to the analysis of first news article. This news article is with reference to the judgment given by Madras High Court on the relation between the Lieutenant Governor who is appointed by the President for the Center and the elected government of Union Territory of Puducherry. In this context, we will see in brief about Puducherry, its government and some important points about the verdict. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. See, the Union territory of Puducherry, it comprises of former French establishments in India. These are the French establishments in Puducherry, Karaikal, Mahe and Yanam. And of these four regions, Puducherry is the largest. It is surrounded by the state of Tamil Nadu and in the east it is surrounded by Bay of Bengal. And it is located around some 150 kilometers south of Chennai. Coming to Karaikal, it is about 150 kilometers further south of Pondicherry. Like Puducherry, it is also surrounded by Tamil Nadu and Bay of Bengal. When we come to Mahe, it is about 653 kilometers west of Puducherry and it is on the west coast near Telicherry in Kerala. And coming to Yanam, it is located at about 840 kilometers northeast of Puducherry and it is on the east coast near Kakinada in Andhra Pradesh. The French handed over these regions to India in the year 1954 and subsequently it was administered as an acquired territory in 1962. See this is based on the treaty between the Republic of France and India establishing cession by French Republic to the Indian Union of the French settlements in India. This treaty was signed on May 28, 1956. So it was administered as an acquired territory till 1962 and then it was made as a union territory by 14th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1962. And we know that every union territory is administered by the president through an administrator appointed by him. And at present, the administrator for Puducherry is called as Lieutenant Governor. But in 1963, Parliament enacted a legislation called as Government of Union Territories Act. This legislation has created a legislative assembly and council of ministers headed by a chief minister for the union territory of Puducherry. This legislation was made to give effect to Article 239, Capital A of Indian Constitution. So the title of Article 239A is creation of local legislatures or council of ministers or both for certain union territories. Clause 1 states that Parliament may by law create for the union territory of Puducherry a legislature, a council of ministers. So it is based on this article, Parliament has enacted the Government of Union Territories Act of 1963. And coming to the legislative power of Puducherry, subject to the provisions of this 1963 Act, the Legislative Assembly of Union Territory of Puducherry can make laws on any subject of state list and concurrent list. And this union territory comes under the jurisdiction of Madras High Court. And know that according to Article 241 of Indian Constitution, Parliament may by law constitute a High Court for a union. Union territory. So though the Union Territory of Puducherry has an elected legislature and council of ministers headed by chief minister, there is control of parliament and president. There is control of central government. There have been frequent frictions between the lieutenant governor and the elected representatives. So that is why we have been often seeing in news about the lieutenant governor and chief minister have been quarreling and fighting over several issues. In 2019, a case was filed in Madras High Court. A single judge bench of High Court has said that lieutenant governor has no power to interfere in the day-to-day -day activities of the union territory. So this verdict was actually in favor of the elected government as it curtailed the powers of Lieutenant Governor. This verdict was appealed again in Madras High Court and the two judge bench have given a verdict yesterday. Now let's have a look into some of the important points in the verdict. First, this verdict has struck down the previous judgment given on 30th April 2019. That is, this verdict has set aside the earlier judgment. One of the reasons why that verdict was set aside is because the previous verdict treated legislature of a union territory equal equal with state legislature. According to yesterday's verdict, this should not be the case because state legislatures or a creation of constitution. Earlier we saw that Article 239A in itself did not create 
legislature of a union territory rather it states that it is the parliament which may by law create legislature and a council of ministers and yesterday's judgment has stated that equating the status of a state legislature with legislature of a union territory cannot be done by judiciary or cannot be done by judicial pronouncement rather it has to be through a legislative process through the appropriate legislature which is actually they are meaning parliament so as of now there is no such law that equates legislature of a union territory with legislature of a state so this verdict actually implies that the center through the president do enjoy considerable amount of authority over this union territory of puducherry and judgment has said that 1963 act and the rules of business of government of puducherry 1963 both these things have clearly laid down the roles for elected government the lieutenant governor and the center so given these roles the lieutenant governor should not have too much control and given these roles the court said that the lieutenant governor is not meant to be overwhelmingly overreaching the lieutenant governor should not act in such a way to exercise too much control on the other hand the lieutenant governor should not be given a mere illusory role the lieutenant governor should act as a bridge between the center and the popularly elected government while these are with reference to lieutenant governor the government of union territory should keep in mind that the very creation of legislature is an outcome of constitutional supremacy where the constitution has given the power to create legislatures to the parliament and the central government has to play the role of an umpire whenever there is a disagreement between lieutenant governor and the council of ministers so as a result of these parameters the roles of lieutenant governor and the elected government are connected or intertwined by law here when we say law we are referring to 1963 act and also the rules of business of government of puducherry 1963 which prescribes the roles to the lieutenant governor elected government and the center so all these three stakeholders have to work in unison and not in division so this simply means that both the center through the lieutenant governor and elected government should follow cooperative operative federalism to ensure proper governance if this is there this will make the common people who is the source of authority of a government to feel that the system is working efficiently that is why the high court has observed that a government is a trustee for the little man who should not have a perception that the running of the government is a gigantic conspiracy so these are some of the important information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw a few important information about the union territory of puducherry the legislation pertaining to it and important points from the judgment delivered yesterday by the madras high court most probably soon there will be a appeal to the supreme court as practically experts are saying this judgment may not work well for the union territory of puducherry now let's move on to next news article this news article is about yuva vigyani karyakram or uvika program the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference see isro has launched a special program from 2019 this program is for school children the name of the program is young scientist program translated as yuva vigyani karyakram This program is primarily aiming at imparting basic knowledge on space technology, space science and space applications to the school children. The objective is to arouse the interest of youngsters in the emerging areas of space activities and that is why ISRO is calling this program as Catch Them Young. And in this program it is proposed to select 3 students from each state or union territory. these students will participate in the uvika program scheduled to be conducted in may 2020 last year the first session of uvika program was conducted in may 2019 and among the school children only those who have finished 8th standard and currently studying in 9th standard will be eligible for the program know that this program will be a residential training program for a duration of 2 weeks during summer holidays in this year it is to be scheduled in may 11 to 22 there will be special lectures special talks eminent scientists will share their experience there will be lab visits there will be exclusive sessions for discussion with experts and there will be also practical and feedback sessions and know that here the selection of students will be based on academic performance and extracurricular activities 
when we say academic performance here it refers to performance in the 8th standard examination then membership in science or space club is also given a 5 percentage weightage and prize winning in any school based individual extracurricular activity is also given due importance this could be in elocution debate essay writing science quiz computer modeling however the prize have to be obtained at the level of district level or state level national or international level here we can see the weightage vary with the levels of winning the prizes 20 percent weightage have been given for students studying in village or rural schools and of the total seats in this program few seats are reserved for oca candidates as well so as of now the news article states that isro has shortlisted 368 students for the uvca program the final list of the selected candidates from each state and union territory will be released probably by the end of march so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article we saw in brief about this uvca program now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article is with reference to some of the amendments proposed to the Russian constitution which may facilitate Mr. Vladimir Putin to become president again. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. And we know that President Vladimir Putin is a former Russian intelligence KGB officer. His political career began in 1996. Within a span of four years, in 2000, he was elected as the president of Russia. And again, after the then term of four years, he was re-elected as president for the second term in 2004. His second term came into an end in the year 2008 and during the period from 2008 to 2012 he served as Prime Minister of Russia because the Constitution of Russia under its Article 81 states that one and the same person may not be elected President of the Russian Federation for more than two terms running. Then in 2012 he became President and in 2018 again got re-elected as president whose term is set to end in 2024. So according to the existing provisions of constitution after 2024 he has to vacate the office of the president. Here when we say Russian Federation it includes many territories, regions, cities of federal importance, autonomous regions and some autonomous areas as well. And as per the Russian constitution the president is the head of the state and the term of office at present is six years. And when we say president is the head of the state in Russia, it doesn't mean with respect to the powers how we say in India, the president is the head of the state and prime minister is the head of the government. Because the powers in the hands of Russian president is more comparing to the powers in the hands of Indian president. The Russian president is elected by the citizens of Russian Federation on the basis of universal adult suffrage where there is equality of votes and elected by direct elections by secret ballot. So this is about the office of president of Russia. In India, if you see the term of office of president, it is five years and the president is indirectly elected in our country. If you see article 54 of Indian constitution, the president shall be elected by the members of an electoral college. This electoral college will have elected members of both houses of parliament and elected members of legislative assemblies of the states. And as per article 57 of Indian constitution, Indian president is eligible for re-election and there are no limits for the number of terms a president can hold the office in India. Now let's come to the news article. In January 2020, President Putin has proposed a package of constitutional amendments so as to widen the powers of president and also to widen the powers of the parliament of Russia. One of the amendments is to ban Russian officials from having foreign citizenship. What happened recently on 10th March is that when the amendment was in process in the parliament of Russia, one of the lawmakers from the ruling party, Valentina, has proposed to amend the constitution in such a way that the president can start his first term fresh by contesting elections in 2024 and again he can be re-elected in 2030 as well. However, we do not know the exact provisions in the Russian amendment bill. News reports are saying that yesterday the proposals made by President Putin and some of the lawmakers of the ruling party have been passed either in total or in part by the Russian parliament. 
here when we say Russia's parliament, it has two houses. That is, it is a bicameral legislature, how we have in India. Russian parliament is called as Federal Assembly, where the lower house is called as Duma and the upper house is called as Federation Council. Once the bill is passed in Russian national legislature, it will be sent to federal regions for their consideration. And as per Russian constitution, these kind of amendments have to be supported by at least two-thirds of regional legislative bodies. And once the amendment is successfully passed, even at the level of regional legislative bodies, the president will forward the proposed changes to the Constitutional Court of Russia. And this Constitutional Court will decide the constitutionality of these amendments. And as per reports, if the Constitutional Court approves the amendment, the proposals would be put for a nationwide vote on 22nd April 2020. And if majority of voters support these amendments, it will affect amendment to the Russian Constitution. And once the president issues the order, the amended constitution will be published and with the publication the amendments will come into effect so the whole world is now looking to these provisions as reports are saying that vladimir putin may become the president of russia for his life so these are some of the information with reference to the analysis of this news article and the process of constitutional amendment is said to be similar like india there is also different procedures to amend different provisions of the constitution now let's move on to the analysis of next news article these two news articles are with reference to coronavirus disease 2019 the syllabus relevant for the analysis of these news articles are highlighted here for your reference the news article in the front page states that more than 1.1 8 lakh individuals are affected by this coronavirus disease 2019. Infected patients are distributed across 114 countries of the world and as a result, World Health Organization has declared this disease as a pandemic. In this context, let us first see in brief what do we mean by an outbreak, epidemic and pandemic based on the definitions given by World Health Organization. See, outbreak is defined by World Health Organization as the emergence of human human cases of infectious disease and it also includes the rapid spread that will cause not only illness but also potential death. So the term outbreak is more with reference to emergence of a disease which affects human beings and such a disease which is spreading rapidly causing illness and death. Now let us see what do we mean by epidemic. See epidemic refers to abnormal occurrence of cases of a particular disease in a community. These number of cases vary from country to country and these numbers are determined by the size of the population of the country and size and type of population who are affected by the disease to announce a particular disease as epidemic will also be determined based on previous experience of a particular country whether such a country has been exposed to such a disease earlier or not and it is also based on the time and place of occurrence of a disease. So based on these parameters, a disease is called as epidemic. Now that World Health Organization maintains a list of epidemics in various countries. Now let's come to what do we mean by a pandemic? See, the first condition to become a pandemic is that a disease has to be an epidemic. Therefore, pandemic is nothing but an epidemic that crosses borders between nations and something that usually affects a large number of people. And initially we saw around more than 1 lakh patients are suffering from COVID-2019 across 114 countries. The last declared pandemic prior to COVID-2019 was H1N1 novel influenza A infection. So yesterday, WHO has characterized COVID-2019 as a pandemic and it is the first pandemic that is caused by a coronavirus. And World Health Organization has asked countries to take urgent and aggressive actions to counter this pandemic. India has taken many actions in this regard. Central government has issued an advisory so that all visas except some are suspended until 15th April. The advisory of the central government mentions that any travelers, including Indian nationals, who are coming from these seven countries or who have visited these seven countries and who come to India after 15 February, they will be quarantined for a minimum period of 14 days to contain the spread of disease if someone who is coming is infected. And also traffic through land borders will be restricted. Now let's come to the news article that appeared in the Nation column. It states that at a meeting of high level group of ministers, it was decided that all states and union territories should be advised to invoke provisions of section 2 of epidemic 
academic disease act of 1897 see this group of ministers was constituted to review the measures taken for the management of covid-19 in our country in this context let us see few important provisions of epidemic disease act of 1897 see this act provides for better prevention of spread of dangerous epidemic diseases section 2 of the act and section 2 capital a of the act discusses about the role to be played by state governments and central government respectively see section 2 it states that if the state government is satisfied that the ordinary rules and regulations are not sufficient to prevent outbreak of any dangerous epidemic disease then the state government or any person empowered by the state government can take preventive measures and for this purpose the state government may even prescribe temporary regulations in the form of public notice and as per section 2 subsection 2b of this act the state government may take measures and prescribe regulations so as to inspect suspected persons traveling by railways or otherwise as well and government can segregate them in hospital or any temporary accommodation or anywhere else similarly for the central government there is a section section 2 capital a this section is specific to the ships and vessels that leaves india or arrives india if persons sailing or arriving in these vessels if they are suspected to have any dangerous epidemic disease then they can be put under detention by the central government so these are some of the provisions that gives power to central government and state governments to take effective action in countering dangerous epidemic disease here covid 2019 is a dangerous epidemic yesterday announced as pandemic by world health organization so in this analysis we saw about the definition of outbreak epidemic pandemic in one sense generally they say outbreak is with reference to a region of the country and epidemic is with reference to many regions in a country or the entire country and pandemic is with reference to many any countries and we also saw few provisions of epidemic disease act now let's move on to next news article this editorial article is with reference to us taliban peace deal that was signed in doha see doha is the capital of qatar we have framed a map based question based on this information this article discusses the implications to india and some other points with reference to this deal first point it states that the deal symbolizes the failure of united states administration and its military campaign in afghanistan because it could not end violence in afghanistan because it could not defeat the taliban and also because it could not rebuild and stabilize afghanistan and this deal therefore is more about providing an honorable exit to us forces and also its allies from afghanistan that's why the editorial is titled as fail safe exit for america and the author states that the us taliban deal signifies victory of religious fundamentalism in the region particularly in south asia and it may serve as an inspiration for such like minded outfits in south asian region and also in middle eastern region and to the question whether there will be direct physical impact on kashmiri youth the author states that this will be negligible if taliban returns to power in afghanistan however there will be psychological impact among the disenchanted or dissatisfied kashmiri youngsters the author states that many of the youth could think the taliban has defeated the mighty superpower usa in afghanistan with the help from pakistan army so defeating indian forces in kashmir will not be impossible after all so in this way the youths in kashmir may think and they may take violence in their hands is what the author tries to convey so government of india has to mitigate the challenge pertaining to this psychological impact among the indian youths in kashmir then the author mainly criticizes india stating that india's approach with taliban is a self defeating approach and as a result he says india is the only country that seems to be in the losing end presently india is having moralistic approach that indicates that india will talk only to the legitimate government of the country while the author states that smart state craft or smart diplomacy is something dealing with what you have and making the best of it however this is author's opinion subject to support and criticism the author actually asks india to reach to taliban forces as the world expects the reality in future would be a taliban led government or taliban led ruling in afghanistan so in such situation india should reach to taliban and india should take the taliban which is now changed from the 1990s taliban so as to suit india's geopolitical and geo strategic advantages author states that the present taliban if forms a government in afghanistan may not be a puppet in the hands of pakistan government or pakistan military so these situations or chances india should exploit 
is what the author's point. And more importantly, one new point given by this editorial is that the withdrawal of United States from Afghanistan is more satisfactory and comfortable for China, Pakistan, Iran and Russia. This is because for them, more than Taliban, US is the bigger challenge. So these are some of the important information from this editorial. Now come to this question. It asks which of the following countries share land border with Qatar, the country where the recent US Taliban deal was signed. Oman, Afghanistan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. See, according to government of Qatar and if you can observe this map, Qatar shares land border only with Saudi Arabia. However, it is stated that Qatar shares maritime boundary with Bahrain, Iran and United Arab Emirates. So the correct answer for this question is option C, 4 only because it shares land border only with Saudi Arabia. Now let's move on to the practice questions discussion session. This question is with reference to Union Territory of Puducherry. They have given two statements and are asking which of the above statements are correct. First statement, Article 239, Capital A, Capital A enabled the Parliament to create a legislature for Union Territory of Puducherry. See, this statement is incorrect. Generally, with reference to administration of Union Territories, we can say that Article 239 is there. However, when we come to the power delegated to Parliament to create local legislature for Union Territory of Puducherry, it is not Article 239, capital A, capital A. It is Article 239A. This Article 239A was inserted through 14th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1962. Now, what does Article 239A A deal with? This article is related to national capital territory of Delhi and this article was inserted through 69th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1991. This article states that the Union Territory of Delhi shall be called as the National Capital Territory of Delhi and according to Clause 2 of this article, there shall be a Legislative Assembly for National Capital Territory of Delhi. So we can say that with reference to Legislative Assembly of Union Territory of Puducherry, it is the law that created by the Parliament has created the Legislature for Puducherry, whereas Constitution itself has created the Legislative Assembly for National Capital Territory under Article 239AA. Now come to the second statement. It states that the Chief Minister of Union Territory of Puducherry shall be appointed by the Lieutenant Governor. See, with reference to states, the Chief Minister and other ministers shall be appointed by the Governor of the state. However, with reference to Union Territory of Puducherry, as per Section 45 of Government of Union Territories Act 1963, the Chief Minister of UT of Puducherry shall be appointed by the President and other ministers shall be appointed by President on the advice of Chief Ministers. So here both the statements are incorrect. Therefore, the correct answer for this question is Option D, neither one nor two. This question is with reference to UVCA program of ISRO. They have given two statements. They are asking which of the above statements are correct. First statement, it was launched by ISRO with an objective to arouse the interest of youngsters in the emerging areas of space activities. See, UVA means youth or youngsters. First statement is correct, logically. Come to the second statement. Those who have just finished 12th standard or just joined their graduation are eligible for this program. This statement is incorrect. This is because according to the UVA Vigyani Karyakram program of ISRO, those who have finished 8th standard and currently studying in 9th standard are eligible for the program. So the youngsters referred in the first statement actually those school children who have finished 8th standard and those who are currently studying in 9th standard. So basically this scheme gives primacy to those who undertake formal education in schools as it considers the academic performance in the 8th standard examination. So here only the second statement is not correct. Therefore the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. This question is with reference to Office of President of India and Office of President in Russia. Two statements have been given and they are asking which of the above statements are correct. First statement, the term of Office of President of India and Russia is the same. This statement is incorrect. This is because at present the President of India's term is 5 years whereas the Russian President's term is 6 years. Coming to the second statement, the President of India is elected through indirect elections similar to Russia. First half of the statement is correct because President of India is elected through indirect elections as per Article 54 of Indian Constitution. The Electoral College for this indirect election consists of elected members of both Houses of Parliament and elected members of Legislative Assemblies of the States. However, if you take Russia, there the election of president is based on direct 
elections or direct suffrage so both the statements are incorrect therefore the correct answer is option d neither one nor two now this question is with reference to coronavirus disease 2019 first statement covid 19 is the first pandemic caused by a coronavirus this statement is correct and second statement severe acute respiratory syndrome was declared as a pandemic in 2002 this statement is incorrect because SARS coronavirus identified in 2002-2003 was not declared as a pandemic. However, SARS coronavirus 2 which is the virus that has caused COVID-2019 and this disease has been announced by World Health Organization as pandemic and in fact it is the first pandemic caused by a coronavirus. So the correct answer here is option A one only. Now let's move on to comments and clarification session. See this comment is with reference to our discussion about the January amendment that was made to the schedule of environment impact assessment notification of 2006. The viewer asks whether category B2 projects do not require any clearance but rather in our discussion we have stated that it require clearance from concerned state environment impact assessment authority as we know all projects and activities are broadly categorized into two categories by the eaa notification of 2006 this categorization is based on the spatial extent of potential impacts and the extent of potential impacts on human health and natural and man-made resources this is as per section 4 of this notification and and here when we say category a projects these projects require prior environmental clearance from central government in the ministry of environment and when we say category b projects irrespective of whether it is category b1 or whether it is category b2 these projects will require prior environmental clearance from concerned state environment impact assessment authority or union territory environment impact assessment authority this is as per section 4 subsection 3 of this notification 2006 so there is no difference between b1 subcategory and b2 subcategory based on the authority from which it has to get prior environmental clearance however there is a difference when it comes to the requirement of environment impact assessment report when it comes to the requirement of process of scoping and public consultation because category b2 projects are exempted from these requirements such as eia report scoping and public consultation now this comment is with reference to our discussion on s bank crisis on 7th march 2020 the viewer asks who gives moratorium order whether it is central government or reserve bank of india first we have to note that moratorium on a bank is based on statutory provision so when we say statutory provision it means it is based on the provisions of law what is this law it is banking regulation act of 1949 here under section 45 there is a provision titled as power of reserve bank to apply to central government for suspension of business by a banking company and to prepare scheme of reconstitution or amalgamation here the term moratorium refers to temporary suspension of banking business and it will happen according to the terms and conditions in the moratorium order so the question is who issues this order of moratorium is it RBI which is the banking regulator or is it the central government see the answer is central government because section 45 states that first RBI will apply to central government to impose a moratorium the central government after considering the application which was made by the reserve bank it may make an order of moratorium to the particular bank here the moratorium also assumes the meaning of staying the commencement or continuance of all actions or proceeding against the banking company for the period of moratorium that is for a fixed period of time and see this moratorium period may be extended from time to time by the government and the total period of moratorium shall not exceed six months so the moratorium order is issued not by reserve bank of india but by the central government now this comment is with reference to our discussion on the title nuclear race on 7th march 2020 the viewer has asked though iran has nuclear weapons why it is not recognized as a nuclear weapon state has it dismantled all its nuclear weapons here we have to note one thing on that day we saw in brief about the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons we saw it came into force in 1970 and know that and iran is a party to this treaty and also way back in 1970 iran has ratified this treaty as well and with reference to ensuring compliance for this treaty international atomic energy agency has the authority to inspect the party to this treaty and previously it has 
been announced by International Atomic Energy Agency that Iran has failed to comply with the provisions of Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, particularly regarding the possession and enrichment of nuclear material. As a result, there has been concerns whether Iran is developing nuclear weapons or not. Now, the statement of Iran with reference to these allegations is that it has enriched uranium only to use as fuel in nuclear power plants and for peaceful purposes and not for weapons and to put appropriate checks and balances and to remove the fears with respect to Iran. Even in 2015, there was Iran nuclear deal or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The main objective of this deal is to ensure that Iran does not use nuclear energy for non-peaceful purposes. However, we know in 2018, US has withdrawn from the deal. As a result, it is reported that this deal has now become ineffective. And following the withdrawal of United States and following various sanctions imposed on Iran by United States, Iran has started its nuclear enrichment program. But there is no official confirmation that Iran possesses nuclear weapons. And one main thing is that that Iran never showcased their nuclear weapons like North Korea, which has publicly stated and conducted nuclear tests. And given the various sanctions imposed on Iran by United States and various sanctions, you know, from uh, Financial Action Task Force and other countries, in future, there is a chance that Iran may publicly declare its nuclear weapon program. So it will be at that time, it will be declared as a nuclear weapon state. So until then, Iran is doubtful to be called as a nuclear weapon state, though there are enough concerns about its nuclear program. With this, we come to the end of today's The Hindu News Analysis. If you like the video, click the like button, comment, share and subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation. We'll meet you tomorrow.